And then I woke up. I would never walk again if I tried that. This is a beautiful stage. This is a beautiful building. And you are a beautiful people. And I thank my good God in heaven that he has spared my life to allow me to come to be with you this week to spend this time together. I love Terrence and Sheena. they just wonderful friends, getting to know Jason and BJ, Tom, and is it Karen? Carol. Carol, Tom and Carol. Looking forward to getting to know them better, and that was a beautiful prayer that you led, brother. And the singing was absolutely amazing. It's difficult to preach when you have to follow poor singing. And that is not the case in this congregation. God bless you, brethren, for your desire to learn, to know, and to love truth the way that you do. For the school of preaching that is under the oversight of this eldership and all the students and their families, all the faculty, may God richly bless you as you prepare yourself to go out and to preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus. I want to talk this morning about Calvary. I want to tell you a story, the story of Calvary. And today I want you to see my words. I don't want you to just listen to my words. I want you actually to see my words. And Luke 4 and 13, when the devil had ended off all of his temptation... The King James says he departed from him for a season. Literally, he departed from him for a more opportune time. Now, Calvary will be the Lord's final temptation, and it will be his greatest. In the first temptation, Luke's account ends on a foreboding note, and he says that the devil is going to come back when the time is more opportune. Now, these words foreshadow a, the, a, a sequel to the great duel that the devil had with Jesus in the wilderness. But the second grab for the Lord's soul would have to be more strategically planned than the first. And Satan knows this. And the setting, it would have to be different too. Starker, more desolate, more hopeless. And the timing, the timing would have to be different too. It would have to be, as Luke suggests, a more opportune time. And the word that Luke uses is kairu. And this word is used elsewhere in Scripture of a time when fruit is hanging heavy on the branch, a time ripe for picking, a harvest time, if you will. Now, the time of Satan's first temptation was when Christ's ministry was just beginning to bloom, when all was before him, all looked hopeful. And the devil knows that if he comes again, it's going to have to be a time when the bloom was off the branch, when all hope was gone, and that time is now. The ministry is dead and so almost is Jesus. He suffered the loss of sleep, the loss of blood, and the loss of his friends. He's never been more tired than he is now. He's never been more weak. He's never felt more alone than he is now. And so Satan knows that this is that opportune time the devil watched from the corners of the upper room. He heard Jesus announce that before this night ends, one of you will betray me. He heard Jesus say, as the disciples began to ask in stereo, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Jesus announced, it is he who dips his hand with me in the dish. So he watched all of that from the upper room. The devil waited in the shadows of Gethsemane. He heard Jesus plant the disciples on the periphery of the garden, then take Peter, James, and John deeper into the garden, and he heard them, heard Jesus say, watch and pray. He saw Jesus go deeper into the garden, the stones throw fall on his knees and his face. He heard Jesus say, Father, if it's at all possible, allow this cup to pass from me. 
He witnessed the betrayals and the trials and the mockings and the beatings. And he knows that the soul of the Son of God has never been more ripe for the picking, nor more within his reach. So he comes this one last time for one final try, rubbing his hands together, and he approaches the tree in the middle, reaching for the branch that is heavy with fruit, straining to grab it before it falls into the hands of his father. Now the setting for this final temptation is a chalky knoll just outside of Jerusalem's northern wall, scooped with uh, shallow caverns, and the rounded hill looks grim and ominous and well fitted to its name, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And as you stand in the city, the skull stares away from the city. Its stone gaze is unmoved by the vultures and the crows and the other winged scavengers that stilt across its brow, pecking around for remains of the dead. I want you to see it, folks. Three vertical beams are staked to the top of that hill, standing tall and unshaded in the morning sun, just like soldiers after Reveille, standing at attention, awaiting the day's assignment. And the assignment today, two thieves and a religious zealot. Open your Bible with me to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. Oh, listen to that music to heaven's ears. Men and women thumbing through the pages of God's book. Music to heaven's ears. Isn't that beautiful? The pages have about stopped turning. Matthew 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, that would have been high noon. Now from the sixth hour, it says there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour or three o'clock. So that was an ominous shadow, so to speak. And to the superstitious Romans, this would have been very unnerving, that the sun ceased to shine for those three hours. And then in verse 46, at about the ninth hour, now Jesus would have died at the ninth hour or three o'clock in the afternoon. The evening oblation was offered in Judaism at 3 p.m. So about the ninth hour, it says, Jesus, Anna, Boao, Anna, up, Boao, shout. And so Jesus shouted up, and the verb tense and the mood that is used here suggests to us that Jesus had kept his thoughts and his feelings so pent up for so long that when he finally spoke, his voice literally exploded across the horizon of Golgotha. It was as if Jesus pushed his head back against the timber and pressed his face against the floor of heaven and he shouted up so as to speak to his heavenly father one on one and back in our text it says he shouted up with a megas phone megas mega loud phone phone voice when Jesus shouted this question up to heaven it was as if he was shouting through the end of a megaphone saying the next word saying present tense verb which means that it repeats he said over and over and over this question what was the question Eli Eli lama sabachthani repeated Eli Eli lama sabachthani Aren't you glad that God has not left us in the dark relative to these Aramaic words and being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou? King James has forsaken me. More about that in just a, a few seconds. But I want to ask you this. Are you the first one that ever cried out why? No, Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you 
And then the Holy Spirit uses an interesting Greek word to translate the end of that Latin expression, why hast thou a catalipo? A catalipo, lipo, leave, cut a down, egg out. A catalipo to leave down and out. My God, my God, why have you left me down and out? And if you and I search our hearts this morning, we know the answer to that question. We must begin in the upper room. All of this took place on Friday. Let's back up to Thursday night. And you and I are walking arm in arm, hand in hand, and we go into a building, to a house, and before us is a little makeshift ladder or a staircase that leads up to an upper chamber. We climb that together. We get up there and down at the end of the corridor, we see a room and there's lights, candle lights are flickering on the wall and we hear voices and you and I walk down there and we walk into that room. There are 13 men in that room and the one who's talking, we know who that is. And he says, before the night is ended, one of you shall betray me. And he tells Judas, what thou doest, do quickly. There was a provision in the law of Moses back in Exodus 21, verse number 32, that an adult male slave could not be sold less than 30 pieces of silver. Judas leaves, goes to do his dastardly deed, sells Jesus for bottom dollar to the Jews. And we see Jesus and the 11 disciples that were left. They come down that same little staircase. They walk down the Kedron Valley across the brook Kedron up into the Mount of Olives where it is found the Garden of Gethsemane. And we see Jesus plant eight of the disciples on the periphery of the garden. He takes Peter, James, and John deeper into the garden and he tells them, watch and pray. And Jesus goes in deeper into the garden and he falls on his face and he begins to pray, Father, if it's at all possible, allow this cup to pass for me, but not as I will, but thy will be done. And so Luke twenty two forty four 44 says that Jesus prayed in the garden until his sweat became as though it were great drops of blood. And he prayed, let this cup pass from me. And he was suffering from a mild form of shock in the garden, knowing that his hour had come. He arose, he went back to the disciples where they were waiting for him, and instead of praying, they were asleep. He did that a second time. And the third time, Mark 14, 41 tells us. And then when he came back the third time, he tells them, take your rest. You're going to need it for the events that are following. And now we see the torches flicker in the uh, night uh, sky and we hear the footsteps of the foot soldiers and we hear the chains rattling. And Judas comes up and he betrays the good Lord with a kiss. Peter draws his sword, cuts off Malchus's right ear, John 18, 10. Jesus tells Peter to put up your sword again into its sheath. The cup that my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And Jesus reaches down into the dirt, gets that old bloody ear, slaps the sand and the dirt off of it, sticks it back up on the side of Malchus's head. And I don't know about you, brethren, but right now I'm a believer. If I'd seen that, I'd know something is special about this man. And the soldiers bind the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. We sing that old hymn, John 18, 12. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. And Jesus went through a series of mock trials that night before the Sanhedrin to Pilate to Herod and back to Pilate that had no fewer than 20 irregularities in it. And Pilate said, I find no fault in him. I'll chastise him and I'll release him, Luke 23, verses 16 through 22. Pilate then asks, what shall I do with Barabbas? And the mob yelled in chorus, release him, release him, Luke 23, 18. What then shall I do with Jesus? And the mob yelled in chorus, 
Crucify him. Crucify him. Luke 23, 21. Now Pilate thought that he could satisfy them by giving them some blood. So the order was given. Jesus was to be scourged. John 19, 1. Now friends, scourging was no light thing. It was no little thing. The word scourging means in that text of John 19, 1, when you do a word study, it means the flesh hung in ribbons on his back. His flesh was in ribbons. As a matter of fact, Domitian, the bloodiest emperor perhaps to ever live, could not witness, could not view a scourging. They were so evil and so bad. Now, Jesus would have been receiving his beating from a Syrian. The Syrians were annexed by Rome in 64 B.C., and they became a Roman province. Antioch was its chief city, and they were forced to do Rome's dirty work. They were forced to serve in the Roman army. The Jews were not. For a soldier that will not fight on Saturday is not worth very much, is he? And the Syrians and the Jews hated one another for a thousand years. So the Syrian steps into the prisoner's dock to see who he's going to get a beat that day, and it's a Jew. Oh, my, I'm going to get me a Jew. I get to beat me a Jew. A thousand years of hate was cut out of the back of our Lord. Now, a man had to either be half drunk or animal to do this, but it was a job. The clothing would be removed, hands tied or hoisted high above the head, pulled up on the tiptoes to further stretch the skin. And a man would take what we might call a cat of nine tails. And the thongs that would come out of the end of that whip, they would roll them in bits of bone metal and glass, tie knots in the end of it with little sharp bone fragments. And the knot hitting the skin leaves a bruise. The bruise fills with fluid. The, blo- the bone lacerates that. Our Lord would have been a bloody mess. A thousand years. The whip leaving that welt and then exposing the flesh and then exposing the bone. History records for us that one man, one historian said that when he saw a crucifixion after this man had been scourged, you could, it would, the whip would come around and jerk out the rib meat. said you could literally look inside his body cavity and see his vital organs working. Some have lost an eye. A piece of that whip would come around, rip out an eye. Now, not every scourged person was crucified. The crime might simply be you get the beating, but you get to live if you survive the beating. But every crucified person was scourged. So if you were scourged and were not crucified, then you would wear scars for the rest of your life. Some men even died upon that sea of blood. They had a man that would check the victim after each blow. The Jews would have been there reading sections from the book of Deuteronomy as Jesus was being beaten. And a man would check the victim to see if he could handle one more blow. And he'd order that blow, and the man who swung the lash would render that blow. Well, they beat Jesus to one blow from death, and they place a purple robe upon his back. They put a blindfold upon his face, and they began to dance around him and smite him and hail, King of the Jews, prophesy, who is it that hit thee? And when the blood had become coagulate, they then jerked the robe off to further intensify the pain. They planted a crown of thorns and they pressed it down into his brow. And I'm told and I've read where the thorns in that region emit a poison that's like a bee sting. And I challenge you to find me in Scripture where that, that crown of thorns ever came off. And Pilate says... I find no fault in the man. What shall I do with Barabbas? Release him. Release him. What then shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate's wife had had a dream 
Have thou nothing to do with this just person? I've suffered many things in a dream because of him, Matthew 27, 19, and of the superstitious Romans. That would have been very unnerving. But to satisfy the mob, Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified. Now, Pilate was a politician. And he really didn't want to crucify Jesus, but he was a politician. And so the, in John 18, 36, G, uh, Pilate asked Jesus, so then you're a king. Jesus said, I am a king. And for this point or for this purpose was I born that I should come in, I bear witness to the truth. So Pilate was just a puppet governor set up by the king over the province. He couldn't allow Jesus, who claimed to be a king, live in his province. To Pilate, Jesus was a threat or a rival to the Roman king. So he, had, he made a political decision. So he washed his hands, but not his heart. Now Christ had suffered from a mild form of shock in the garden. He'd been through intensive inter interrogation all night. He'd undergone a severe scourging. He'd been mocked. He'd been slapped. He'd been spit upon in high court. Now he's bearing his cross to Calvary. Crucifixion was a horrible practice. The Romans borrowed it from the Persians and they perfected it. They knew how to put you on the cross. They'd bend your knees up. They knew how to put you on the cross where you could live. History records for us one man lived nine days. Whether it's true or not, that is a historical record. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But history records that one man lived nine days. Now, the victim was made to carry his own timber. And Jesus stumbled over those cobblestone streets. And one of the times he stumbled, he did not get up. And he was yelled at. And he was kicked. And he was mocked. But he still didn't get up. And Simon, a man from Cyrene. Cyrene was in northern Africa. Simon would have no doubt been a black man summoned to carry the cross of our Lord. Brethren, if Simon made it to heaven, when I get there, one of the first things I want to do is look Simon up and hug his neck and thank him for the compassion he had on my Lord that day. They reach Golgotha. The prisoners are exhaust, ex, they're exhausted. The hearts are about to pound out of their chest. Their bodies are slick with sweat, fresh blood oozing from their wounds. They grab Jesus and they throw him down on that rough timber, his back beaten to a bloody pulp. A man jumps across his chest, sits on him, gets his arm, puts it into place. Jesus does not resist. A man sets the spike, and the man who swings the hammer, he does not miss, for he has done this many times before. Can you hear that hammer ringing on that cold steel spike? gets the other arm, puts it into place, sets the spike, and now the hammer. The man that's been sitting on his chest jumps up, spins around, gets his knees and pulls them up to put bow in them, turns his feet to one side, a single spike through his feet. And now the hammer. And that for you, sir, and that for you, ma'am, and also for me. And now they raise him up, and the butt of that cross drops into about an 18-inch socket, and it falls and catches, and the weight of our Lord sags on those nails, and now suspended between heaven and earth, the Son of God, and it's here. It's here the devil makes those three grabs. This is the opportune time. Jesus has never been 
more vulnerable than he is now. And so the devil makes three grabs for the soul of the Son of God. He's more cunning this time around, though. Instead of coming out in a frontal attack as he did in the wilderness, he voices his temptations through the traffic of onlookers that are passing by the cross. They're his mouthpiece, sounding almost as an echo from those windswept windswept hills in the wilderness three or three and a half years prior. The devil delights in seeing Jesus suffer, but he fears what this suffering may accomplish. Grab number one for the soul of the Son of God comes through the religious leaders, feeling their nearness of their... You see, they had Jesus right where they wanted him. How many people ever survived a crucifixion? How many people ever got down from the cross? They had him right where they... And feeling the nearness of their victory, they pack around the cross like jackals cornering a crippled gazelle. Their sneering lips showing their savage teeth. Their biting remarks showing their thirst for blood. And they said, oh, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. Now, brethren, Jesus could have done that. He could have come down from the cross. He could have saved himself, and he could have shown the religious establishment that he truly was the Messiah, the chosen one, the promised seed of Eve through whom the curse of Eden would be reversed, the promised seed of Abraham through whom the entire earth would be blessed, the promised seed of David's throne through whom the kingdom of God would come. So many promises converge at the cross and maybe, and just maybe, there might be still a chance that the devil at this late hour can thwart those purposes if only Jesus would save himself. But their sneers are met only with silence and soon the religious, the rulers, they lose their taste for blood and they leave and the devil returns to his station. Grab number two for the soul of the Son of God came through the soldiers. They pull up a wine-soaked sponge to his mouth, but Jesus turns his head. Then one of the gutter mouth men on the ground curses Jesus and mocks him with a second temptation. Uh, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Jesus opens his swollen eyes and he sees the blur of men below. Oh, what stories these eyewitnesses could tell their superiors if Jesus really did come down from the cross and save himself. What evangelists they would make. What revival would break out in the Roman Empire. How Christianity would flourish under government protection. How legislation would change under Christian influence. It would be an unparalleled opportunity if Jesus would just save himself. But Jesus doesn't save himself. Brethren, he doesn't even save his dignity. He offers no defense. He makes no reply. And seeing little sport in his silence, the soldiers move to the next station and Satan returns to his. Grab number three. For the soul of the Son of God came through one of the thieves. Since the devil couldn't get Jesus through the religious leaders nor through the soldiers, the devil wanted to appeal to the Lord's compassion. Since Christ knew exactly all the pain that this man was suffering, maybe the dying man's suffering would soften Jesus. And so this thief said, Aren't, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Slowly, Jesus turns his head to see the, ang see the man who had just insulted him. And he sees eyes that are lit with anger, anger at life for bringing him there, anger at Rome for nailing him there, and anger at Jesus for leaving him there. How simple it would be for Jesus to ease the burn in the soul that inflames this man's eyes. He's done it so many times before. I mean, there was the Gerizim demoniac, 
and the fire that Jesus extinguished when he expelled the demons from the desert of that man's soul? And what about the woman at Jacob's well in her sacre in Samaria and the living water that he offered her quenched the desperate thirst in her soul? And he can stop the fire in this man's soul too and in the fever in his wounds and in the man next to him. If only Jesus, if only Jesus would save himself and us. Now the good Lord knows that he can save himself or he can save us, but he cannot do both. Brethren, had he come down from the cross and saved himself, he could not have saved us. It was through the giving of himself on that cross that he saved us. Oh, in spite of how much pain he was in, in spite of how tired, in spite of how weak, in spite of how alone, he had the strength to choose us, to die for us, to save us. It was the struggle in the wilderness that prepared Jesus for the sufferings of the cross, giving him the strength to not give in, the courage to not come down, and the selflessness to choose us instead of himself. But now, I want you to see it, folks. I want us to turn our attention to the cross. What do we see? Well, we stop to read a gypsum plaque nailed above the head of Jesus. King of the Jews. What does it mean? He's hung beneath this indictment since nine this morning. By now his legs are cramping, his back is throbbing, his arms are numb, and the tendons in his shoulders are torn from the sockets in his shoulders. But brethren, these are the dregs of the cup given him in the garden of Gethsemane, and he alone must drink them down to the last bitter mouthful. His fever has worsened, his eyes are swollen shut, his throat is parched, his tongue is thick and pasted down, and while we ponder all of this, the ground begins to shake beneath our feet. Soldiers are thrown staggering to the ground. People are running for their lives. They're praying, they're screaming, and they're falling down. Crosses are swaying in the stone sockets. Nails are tearing flesh. Screams are knifing the air. Boulders are tumbling and crashing. Stones sealing the tombs of the dead are shaken open. And now a splash of sunlight hits that hill. And as we're looking up at Jesus, we see him. As we look up, his arms are raised. His head is bowed, his arms reaching skyward at diagonals, a spike through each wrist, lines of blood veining down from the wounds in his hand toward his chest and dripping to the ground, a face mottled with fisted abuse, a rib cage torn from the scourging, knees turned to one side, a spike through his feet. Now they come to break the legs of the condemned. Why do you want to break their legs? They come and they break the legs of the first thief. They break the legs of the second thief. But when they come to Jesus, they break not his legs. Why do you want to break their legs? Because the Romans put you on the cross with, B in your le with bend in your knees. And as you hung on the cross, the pectoral muscle spasmed and you couldn't breathe. You couldn't get the air out. So they push up on that bottom spike, relieve the pressure. <sighs> they get some air into their lungs till they couldn't take that any longer. And they'd sag back down till they couldn't take that any longer. And they'd push back up on that spike. A man with broken legs can't push up on the bottom spike. Death will come by suffocation. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter its glory shall be. Earth holds no treasure, but perish with using. Heaven holds all to me. We sing that. It's all because of Jesus. 
Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. It's all because of Jesus. My name is in the book of life. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Rise above all doubt and strife and read my title clear. My name is there. It's there, and it's there because of Jesus. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. We sing, my sins, my sins, my Savior. How sad on thee they fall. Seen through thy gentle patience, I tenfold feel them all. I know they are forgiven, but still their pain to me is all the grief and anguish they laid my Lord on thee. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now we know the answer to the question. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you left me down and out? Brethren, I'm ashamed to tell you, I'm the reason why. You are too. We're the reason why. 1973, I left my home for, to go with Uncle Sam. And I remember the little farmhouse, the little four-room farmhouse that I grew up in. As you'd walk out the door, there was a nail. Jason, I hung my keys on that nail. And they were there when I came back. We would do that, hang your key on that nail. If you don't get anything else out of this lesson, get this. The key to heaven was hung on a nail. A little lad born amidst the stench of the stable. A young boy at the age of 12 astounding the teachers of the law who grew to be a man nailed to a tree. He astounded the world. Let us stand amazed in the presence of the Savior. That child was born, that child grew up, to manhood and that child died as a man on the cross so that you and I could have the hope of heaven. If you believe that Jesus really is the Christ, the Son of God, willing to repent of your sins, confess His deity, be immersed into Christ for in order to obtain the remission of your sins, then lock arm in arm with the rest of us, fan out into this community and affect it as the salt and light and leaven that God would have you to be. Maybe you've done that, but maybe you've strayed. You've wandered. You're no longer walking in the light as he is in the light. You've allowed the world back down into your bloodstream. And Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says you are alienated from God, if that's the case. Don't leave here separated from God. You can be like our brother Simon in Acts the 8th chapter. You can repent and you can pray that perhaps a thought of thine heart can be forgiven thee. Let us stand and sing. You come to him right now.